Thanks for coming. Um, we are in the we're in the breakout room for Janetta Williams. She is the president of the at AACP, and she's going to be talking about some of the their her experience navigating the legislative process. So I'll turn the time over to you so you can start what you want. Thank you for, for being here. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. Okay, one of the, the things, again, let me just kind of briefly talk about the NAACP first before I jump into everything. Uh, the NAACP is the oldest and largest civil rights organization in the country, founded in 1909. Uh, we have our reverse structure. So we have our president CEO, which is Derek Johnson out of uh, Baltimore, where we're headquartered. And we have our chairman of the board, Leon Russell, and he lives in Florida. So everybody got the face right there in Baltimore. Uh, we have our 64 national board of directors. And that 64 is so large because we represent seven regions and it's broken up into regions so that there's representation on the national board. Uh, for the regions. For instance, we're in Utah is in Region 1, and that's uh, Idaho, Nevada, Utah, which the three states are over, uh, Oregon, Washington, uh, Alaska, Hawaii, California, and Arizona. And so that makes up our Region 1. And of course, we have Region 2 and up to Region 7. Uh, we are a nonpartisan organization. And we uh, do not endorse candidates, but if there is issues, then we of course can get involved in that uh, in those particular issues. But it's not saying that we're endorsing a candidate. So saying all of that, um, when the um, when the murder happened with George Floyd, and that's when all of we saw all of the uprising and all of the riots and even here in Salt Lake City, and we were so shocked. Uh, I'm watching TV and I'm doing interview after interview and TV and Zoom and all of those things. And so the stations were asking, especially, you know, the ones on the radio and TV both really, they were asking, you know, what, what would you say to the people that's not here writing that they can hear you? And I said, I would just ask them to, to please, for comments, go home. You know, stop all of this. You know, we can't settle all of these things out in the streets. And so that was that was good, and I got a lot of good feedback from that, saying that that was that was really good. They appreciated me saying that. But after that happened, uh, the governor had met with a lot of the different communities and met a couple of times with the, with the black community, and then helped pull us all in to say, what is it that that I can do as a government, Governor Herbert at that time, of course. You know, what can I do as a government for our state of Utah? Uh, he felt bad that love so, so many things that was going on that he thought that he was being helpful with, that it wasn't helpful at all. He just felt that, look, you know, I thought I was doing a good job. I'm really have been listening. Uh, I apologize. Let's see what we can do to make this better. And so, uh, you know, giving the credit to Governor Herbert, he pulled together a group of all of us uh, community leaders, community organizations, such as the NAACP, the ACLU, the city, uh, the League of Cities and Towns, the uh, LGBTQ communities, the some of the ministers, legislators. I mean, you name it. He pulled all of us together with the commission. And of course, law enforcement and legislators have said, let's see if everybody can get together, work together, and see what you can do. So that's how we started with our with our small, well, it was supposed to be small, but it kept growing uh, for our what we call kind of a community group. And it was good because we were able to uh, talk about what was one of the different issues that's going on. 
what is it that the groups can to do and and in that group we were able to look at some of the things that the police officers police law enforcement were already doing that, that we didn't know about the communities didn't wasn't aware of and then we were also able to get together and say well this is some of the bills these are some of the things that we need uh, to get done you know here in the state of utah and then we had the legislators up there of course to make sure that we were able to uh, have them um, put the language together so we could sponsor uh, these these bills for us, of course, because you know you can talk as much as you want, but if you don't have somebody there to sponsor the bills, you know it's not going to go anywhere. It's just simply talk. So what we want to do is try to make sure that we were making headway, and so we didn't look at. You know, trying to make sure that this Republican do this, this other Democrat do that. So we were looking at the overall, and the legislators were really good. They came up and said, you know, well, I'll take this one. I'd like to sponsor this one, and that, and that was pretty good. But uh, initially, what what happened was that the NWCD, uh, we led the effort first uh, in early part of June calling a press conference and saying, inviting both Democrats and Republicans to the table and they say, these are some of the initiatives that our national headquarters have given us. You know, we, they want us to talk about no chokeholds, to talk about uh, making sure that we um, have somebody, some ways to, to get data, you know, all of those different things. And so we started that out and then we had um, a Senator Thatcher because he had passed the uh, hate crimes bill recently. And so we wanted to make sure that we were talking to both sides, Republicans and Democrats. And then in doing that, of course, you know, we were working with the uh, president of the Senate as well. And it was just a, a long process. You know, every day there was something going on. Uh, some of the legislators uh, end up, you know, talking and discussing of you know who's going to be the face of this bill and so i didn't want to get in that fight of course i thought let, let them hash that out and because what we want to do is try to make sure that we had somebody uh there to support the uh, and sponsor and co-sponsor the bills in their past so once the the governor brought us all together we, you know we were able to have first we started like weekly and then bi-weekly meetings and then like until almost from like June really until almost uh, close to the legislative session when you know we were getting all of the bills you know ready and and they were you know being written and uh, you know what we needed to do during the beginning of legislative session is making sure that we knew when these bills were going to come in you know for the committee and making sure that we were there to speak, uh, to support those. And so, so, and it was by Zoom, so which was good. So the, the group, they had some of the people come in in person, but what, during the legislative session, we were able to, um, you know, the call in, a lot of the meetings started like maybe eight o'clock in the morning. And then, you know, it was like every morning. And so it made it good, made it good because some of the some of the chairs of the different committees end up in knowing uh, exactly. Of course, some that didn't know me, they end up knowing who I was. And so it was one of the uh, committee chairs said, "I'm going to let Janetta Williams speak first because I like her, and so she's my favorite person." So it, it you know made it good because she kind of got got the good report. Like, uh, so we were able to get quite a few of the bills passed. In fact, on um, when we talked about police reform bills, those were a lot of the ones that we were looking at. Of course, we looked at the housing ones as well. Uh, we looked at a lot of the health care issues. And so with NWCP, you know, it's not just the police reform that we were looking at. So we were we were extremely busy because you know there was some you know health issues that we were making sure that we were uh, looking at. Uh, working with the American Heart Association and others, uh, working with the Wasatch Front Regional Council, for instance, on transportation. So it was a wide variety and it was extremely busy for, for us. 
uh, that seems like 45 days is not many days, but you have to start working before that 45 days start. And so it makes it for a long, really long year, long session. And so I'm sure that the legislators were happy that session was over, but we were also happy when it was over because like I said, it was a lot of work. And uh, some of the things that we were working on, say for instance, we did the um, police reform uh, bill, law enforcement. Uh, some of, we had roughly, let me just tell you some of the ones that we did. We had roughly 34 law enforcement bills. <clears throat> and, and that's really a lot. But out of that 34, we had about, I think it was about 21 that was passed. And that was good. Some of the ones that did not pass was like the, uh, the no knock warrant. And everybody thought, oh yeah, that's gonna pass. Well, I called to support the bill, but then I still behind the scenes were working, was working with the sponsor of the bill saying that this really isn't a no knock bill. That can you do some more work on it? You know, then the NAACP support its, you know, efforts in trying to do a no not uh, no not bill, but but it needs to be had it, it needs some more changes back to it more or less. So um, that person wasn't able to make all the changes, and it ended up uh, not getting not being passed. Uh, another one that did not get passed was the uh, citizen police citizen review boards. And in that, I had also spoken with the person that was sponsoring that bill and said that I don't like portions of this bill. Part of it is saying that the review board will have the ability to hire and fire a police chief. Well, to me, and I served on the police review boards for 20 years in West Valley. And for me, that wasn't something that uh, I felt, uh, as the leader of the NAACP, that a review board should be doing uh, hiring and firing a police chief. So I was very adamant about that. He ended up uh, pulling that bill, um, and so of course it didn't go anywhere. So those are kind of some of the things that we do, and work, you know, behind the scenes because uh, sometimes uh, people think. Oh, you know, the NAACP, you know, where do you stand on this? And we haven't heard you. But a lot of times we're doing a lot of this work behind the scenes as well, too. Uh, for instance, one of the bills that did not get passed, passed was had nothing to do with police reform, but it was called Crown, C R O W N. And that was the bill to uh, Senator the Kitchen with right. And then that bill was saying that. Uh, if you're African American, you can wear your hair natural. You can wear your hair in braids uh, and not be penalized with somebody from your job saying that you can't wear your hair that way. You can't wear the less style. But that one didn't get passed and it didn't get out of committee. But I've asked him to bring it back again this year. And we're hoping, and I gave him some suggestions on ways that we can make sure that we get uh, a head start and get. To get it passed because it's a bill that uh, other states have passed, and we're hoping that we can get it passed here as well. Uh, Nevada was one of the other states that was looking at this particular bill uh, during this last session. So we have had those, but when we talk about the, the police reform, um, we were working with just Anderson, you know, the, the uh, post, of course, we were working with just all kinds of other groups and police, the sheriff's department. Uh, we had all of those folks that were on this committee. So it was it was a very good working committee. Um, so, but uh, for instance, House Bill 162, that was one of the ones that I was working on. It required police officers to undergo, undergo yearly training on mental health responses, arrest control, and de-escalation. Uh, House Bill 301 creates a domestic violence training program for officers. House Bill 334 mandates training on the autism uh, uh, spectrum disorder and other mental illnesses, a bill which came about 
after the uh, shooting of the 13-year-old boy in Salt Lake City. Senate Bill 13, it required law enforcement agencies to report information about officers under certain investigations to post and to provide information about officers to prospective employees if asked. A related bill, Senate Bill uh, 196, provides immunity to agencies that provide that information. Other police bills passed include, uh, include the House Bill 84, which requires law enforcement agents, agencies to submit use of force data to the State Bureau of Criminal Identification. And then House Bill 237, which specifies that officers should not use deadly force on an individual who is suicidal. And House, House Bill 264, which requires officers to report whenever they point a weapon or taser at someone. House Bill 62 expands the ground for discipline a police officer. And Senate Bill 106 requires the Peace Officer Standard Training Council, which is post that I am a member of, to create statewide minimum use of force standards. So these are just some of the bills that were that were passed, and we will continue, as I said before, working um, on some of the ones that did not get passed. You know, one of the ones that was passed was the early on uh, when they had special session was the uh, no joke uh, poll. But some of the um, some of the folks wanted to say, well. Some people, we want to have some people that are trained different to be able to still use the, the chokehold, which you consider having us put that part in. So I was very adamant and I said no, because if you say you can use chokehold, then it has to be this person over here that's more trained than this person over here. And, and so it just gets out of hand. So either you do it or you don't. And we said, no, we don't want them to do chokeholds. And so, because we were so adamant about it, they didn't pursue that particular one to have the chokehold. Uh, that was extremely important to us, not to, not to have that included. So some of the other, other bills that, uh, that we thought was going to be useful was making sure that we had data that we can go back and say, if a police officer is fired from this police department, I'm not going to name, you know, like what it is, but it's fired from this police department, that they can't just go and jump and get hired over another police department. That's what happened with um, the police officer that shot little 12 year old Tamir Rice uh, in Ohio. Uh, the, you know, 911 call and said there was somebody with a gun. And they didn't know that it, it was a 12 year old, 12 year old African American boy that was playing in the park with a play gun. The police officer pulls up in the car. The officer jumps out. And before he tries to apprehend or do any type of de escalation, he just starts shooting and he kills him. Then he finds out later that it was a 12 year old. But in the meantime, after the investigation, they found that he had gone from one police department to this police department. And in the, the first one where he was fired, had said that he was unfit to be a police officer. Unfit to be a police officer. But if that department had known that when they hired him, then maybe they wouldn't hire him at all. So that's why data is so important because people say, well, you know, they're, what if it's just something minor that they get fired at? Well, I, you know, I think the departments can look at those different issues to say, okay, what is it that you did? What is it that, you know, why did you get your, uh, what were you uh, not able to, to continue serving as a police officer in this one department? But then, you, you know, why is it that you go to another state and think that they can hire you for that? So I, I think it's a lot of areas in that. So we can we need to make sure that we can get accurate data, and even so, they're not 
getting, um, for instance, uh, fired from here in Utah, and then they can go to Idaho, and then they can get hired there because maybe they need police officers and they're kind of low on officers. Uh, so they make all these different excuses to go to, to another location to get hired. And it's not that the NAACP is trying to be make it hard for police to officers to get you know jobs or anything like that. We want to make sure that they can get uh, you know we have good officers uh, because we're not looking and saying that every police officer is bad. We work very closely with a lot of the police departments. In fact, this weekend we're doing tomorrow we're doing one and we're doing one on Sunday where we call Faith and Blue where we work together with the faith department for this weekend across, across this, uh, the other states as well. So all, all 50 states are doing this. And we have different uh, faith groups uh, working with Blue. Uh, we've got Blue uh, police officers. And we are all you know, coming together for different things. One of the ones is going to be one police department is going to have a soccer game you know, with the youth. Uh, another one um, is going to have a panelist uh, you know, myself and some of the community groups and uh, church groups, religious groups, uh, and then have a barbecue afterward. Uh, one group is having the officers being invited to join in in uh, the congregation and church services on Sunday. So there's just different ways that, you know, people can work together. And what we're trying to do is have the community feel that they are safe and then if something goes on that they can go and, and, and talk to a, a police officer. For instance, um, one person was saying that they had their little, uh, I think it was a seven year old, uh, into one of the kind of a restaurant and it was about seven or eight police officers there. And the little boy, of course, wasn't afraid of the police officers or anything like that. And he was happy because it was so many of them. And he was so happy and smiling. And then he wanted to take a picture with him. And they said, sure. And they had a little badge. And they gave him a badge. Well, that made a huge difference in, in his uh, demeanor and everything that he had. You know, he didn't have anything negative about police. Because he wasn't afraid of them because uh, he wasn't taught that way. So a lot of things that we know, you know, they're being taught uh, at home or they see things on television. And, and so we, you know, want to make sure that that they have a you know positive experience. And and so that little boy was my great grandson. So he was he was very extremely happy when he had the opportunity to take that picture. And and so one of the things that I think we need to do, we should do, is continue to work with community folks and continue to work, you know, uh, with other groups and organizations. And then if there's some issues that come up, we need to make sure that we can, uh, maybe there's some legislation that we can put together and, and work with them on different issues. So I wanna leave a, a couple minutes for Q and A. And so I will stop there and just wanted to tell you a little bit how that commission came together and how the governor had you know, brought us all together. And so it, it worked out good. In fact, it worked out so good, we said, let's do this again. Let's continue this. And so, of course, we have a new governor. So we've asked him to do the same thing. And uh, Governor Cox, in fact, after these bills were passed, he held, he not only signed a lot of them, but he did a public signing uh, at the, um, at the post, at the post uh, uh, building. Uh, where we had a public signing with the sponsors of the bills and gave us copies of the bill with the ink pens that he signed the bills with, which was really good. So kind of a public ceremony to do that. So that's a, kind of a, a short summary of how we got to where we are today. Okay, so I'll open the Q&A. I just had a quick question when you were talking about the proposed legislation or trying to share information between police departments. Was that primarily the different states weren't able to communicate, or was that also within different departments in the same state? Was well, the states able to share that information? It, it, it was both, because if the state was uh, compiling that data, then, they, then other 
other states uh, without, you know, for instance, somebody going from some, from some, maybe Utah going to Nevada or Idaho, um, then they would be able to obtain that information. But some of that uh, data collection, uh, if they ever pass the, uh, the uh, George Floyd Policing Act, uh, if they get that passed, that, that's part of it to make sure that they have a national database that they can look and find, you know, if that person has been disciplined, why, you know, if he doesn't, uh, if he's not been certified or he had it, you know, taken from him or her and those types of things. Is there another one? All right, well, we appreciate it. Should you come and share your insights, giving us a little insight into what the CP has been doing? I really appreciate that. Thanks for sharing your time. Um, I believe right now we're breaking for lunch. If everybody wants to do it, please sit downstairs. Um, we'll head down there and get some more today. Thank you. Thank you so much.